Good evening, everybody, and very welcome to this conference. My name is Daniela Schilly. I'm the General Secretary of the German War Graves Commission, and I have the pleasure to moderate this conference this evening. I'm very happy that has reached already many questions and commands from 14 different countries. Normally, we would have met today in Berlin with about 400 people to commemorate together the Second World War and to start a new project about Peace Line. You know that due to the coronavirus, this is not, not possible and we had to postpone that. But nevertheless, I'm very happy that we can meet now in this digital surrounding and even in a historic surrounding. Before we will introduce this place to you, I would again welcome all of you and welcome here on this place the State Ministry for International Cultural Policy in the German Foreign Office, Mrs. Michelle Müntefering, welcome. The President of the German War Graves Commission, Mr. Wolfgang Schneiderhan, and our host, the director of the German-Russian Museum, Dr. Jörg Murray. I will give you the, flo the floor first, but before I do so, I would like to make a few remarks to all of you how we could do this conference. You know, we have more or less about one hour for our discussion, and because we have so many questions, we got so many questions, we decided to cluster them into five blocks. This is statements. The first block would be about peace, the second about remembrance, the third about history, and the fourth about European future, and then about the coronavirus and the, the consequences it has on us. After each of these blocks, we could do um, we could pass the questions to our speakers, and I hope you will enjoy this format. And now I will give you the floor, Mr. Moray. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome here to the German-Russian Museum. We are in this room in which uh, uh, World War II in Europe uh, find a final end. So here in this room, uh, the unconditional surrender was signed. Um, this was a kind of ratification. The first step was made a day, two and a half days before in France and Reims in the headquarter of the West Allied troops. So, and 8th on May, uh, all Allied came here to, to Karlshorst to sign a second time in front of the Soviet headquarter. And this is our main topic here in the museum. First of all, um, to, to keep care uh, for, for this historical site. We are nowadays in a cooperation with, uh, um, with uh, Russian museums and uh, museums in Minsk and Kiev as well. So, at the end, there are four nations uh, are caring here for this uh, museum in Berlin. Um, yeah, and you can imagine, uh, even, even today, it's uh, very important for us, and it's so sorry that we are nearly closed. But um, uh, keep in mind, uh, today we have about 1,000, 1,200 visitors, because this room uh, is, has been open, uh, this is possible, and um, so there's uh, is a huge interest, and uh, yeah, every time you're in Berlin, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Now you, you know where we are, and now I would go international and pass the floor to you and to your remarks with the first block about peace. Hello, my name is Anna, and I am from Republic of Moldova. I am much worried about an eventual world war because a generation that didn't go through war may not be afraid of it and because of many extremist views that I noticed lately. I think it is very important to constantly speak about peace and about all the terror that a war may cause. I have a question for everybody at the conference. How do you speak about peace? Do you value it? I hope everybody is aware that we have to remember. Thank you very much. My name is Emilia Mosnegu and I'm from Romania. So my grandmother was born in 1944 and she grew up facing the dire consequences of the war. 
I grew up listening to stories about that time and I was fascinated. I was fascinated because everything was so different from the world we experience today. Um, and now as I'm much older, I, I came to the conclusion that we take everything too much for granted. We take for granted being warm and having our stomachs full, having our parents and acquaintances home, um, having full control of our actions, going to school and being informed, um, being able to judge on our own and to speak our own minds. And me and my generation, we grew up to be so ignorant and individualist to the point where it's almost, it's dangerous and offensive. And today we should um, honor the events of the last 75 years as they, lead, as they led to the peace we have today. Hello, I'm Dvir from Israel and I'm very happy to take part in this uh, discussion and this important project. Um, regarding the topic of World War II, it is quite personal for me because I'm Jewish and many of my family members have died during the Holocaust and the atrocities that accompanied World War II. Um, my main thought about it is really that the most important thing to ensure these things don't repeat themselves is actually to, to learn the lesson and and make sure that the vast majority of people reject ultranationalism, racism and extremism. So in a world that is uh, battling the corona pandemic and other international issues, I think this is even more important than ever. And I would actually like to hear what does Germany and the rest of the EU think should be done in order to address those issues, in order to advance multilateral cooperation, and in order to advance peace in Europe, in the Middle East, and in the rest of the world. Thank you. Hi, I'm Miguel Ballesteros. In the 20th century, we have lived two large-scale wars, two world wars due to the totalitarianism, extremist political views from both sides. For that reason, we have suffered the Armenian Genocide, the Jewish Holocaust, and many other types of crimes. However, we have not to think that this has happened a long time ago, no. Today, we see on the news that war is the solution for many in the world. Therefore, we should try to change this type of thought because it has no place in the 21st century. Dialogue is the solution, respect and tolerance to the human being, to diversity. We are equal and the value of the person shouldn't depend on his culture, religion, skin color, gender or ideology. So my question is, how hate crimes are managed in Germany? Thanks. Well, you heard it, the first block about questions about peace. And we heard, as I think it was Emilia saying, peace can't take it taken for granted. It can always happen again. And I can also add messages from Anderson from Spain and Johanna from Germany, who asked how we can avoid that the past gets forgotten and how can we avoid that new wars are happening. So in this sense, Mrs. Müntefering, I will give you the first question, asking what do you think is necessary to protect peace? And which are the main challenges for that? Yeah, first let me thank you for this invitation and uh, 
hello to everybody in the digital universe out there, especially to Anna, to Emilia, to Dwir, to Miguel, uh, to all those young people who gave us uh, these important questions and are engaging um, in peace. Peace is uh, important and so is freedom. Uh, I think there are siblings and they are the basis of our prosperity and we have to acknowledge indeed neither peace or freedom is a given. So what can we do to preserve peace today? First, in my opinion, is empower civil society. Cultural exchange and personal encounters are the basis of mutual understanding and peace. And contradiction means progress and participation. So don't be afraid to engage and to argue. Second, fair play, which each other and worldwide. We need political education and the joint European perspective of our shared history. Therefore, projects are important like the Franco-German and the Polish-German history books, for example, for students, or the Erasmus program. And third, international cooperation. As Europeans, we should stand up for our vision of fair and just international order. We must not join the club of the big egos of the world. We will only master the big global challenges of today, such as climate change or this pandemic we're facing, if we act together. Thank you for your command. Mr. Schneiderhan, from your professional background as chief of defense staff, in the German army. Do you think another war is possible? And if, how would this look like today? First of all, hello to everybody. Secondly, thanks to you for the most difficult questions I <laughs> could expect today at the beginning. I'm afraid my answer is an honest yes. An honest yes, but. I do not see wars between nations with classical means like the Second World War with tanks, frigates, submarines and things like that. The challenges of today, tomorrow, and I would say the day after tomorrow also, are completely new. We call them asymmetric challenges. Our free and open societies, like you mentioned them, are threatened and challenged by individuals, by groups of individuals, which want to change our society with totally different means from a terrorist background, from a criminal background, ethnic background, whatever you want, but they do not accept our way we decided to have. And the means they have are completely different from the former once. It's a long way. We can look to Afghanistan, we can look in the Near East, Far East, wherever we look, we learn about these new challenges and how they threaten our societies, our free open societies, and free and open societies are most vulnerable. You mentioned it also. And therefore, <coughs> we must think in totally different approach about these challenges of, the few of today, tomorrow, and the future. I think this is the real problem we have, that we are coming from fixed pictures of war, fighting, tank against tank, nation against nation, but this is overcome. In my, it may be in a local area possible, but not in a strategic, worldwide, European-wide means. Thank you very much for this hard, but open answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Mrs. Mintefering. Yes, future would look differently, but anyway, if you look on the next block, remembrance is quite important. And therefore, I would handle again the floor over to the international audience for their questions on remembrance. Hello, my name is Eleni, and I have one question for State Minister. 
Do you think that your government is doing enough in the field of history education in case of suffering Polish people during the war? Let me know. Bye. Hello, my name is Roberta and I'm from Lithuania. However, since last October, I've been doing my master's in history in Berlin. Uh, living in Germany, I have noticed a tendency, especially among young people, to downplay the crimes uh, committed by the Soviet regime, not only in Eastern Europe, such like the Holodomor in the Ukraine, but also in Germany itself. So don't you think that when commemorating the end of the Second World War in Germany, more attention should be paid to such topics like the rape of a German woman uh, by the Red Army or the expulsion of Germans uh, from former East Prussia, Czechoslovakia or Poland. Uh, not only on this occasion, but also in general, because it is still considered to be inconvenient or embarrassing to speak about the sufferings of Germans uh, in the end, uh, at the end of the Second World War and after that. Uh, thank you for your reply. Then the last question is how will the death of the last witnesses change our perception of the World War II and also the Holocaust? Uh, I would like to ask you why is it so important personally for you? How did uh, the Second World War uh, influence your own life? Uh, thank you in advance for your answer. The end of the Second World War means also the stabilization of many regions of the world. So my question is how can we recognize those issues in the commemoration on EU level? Thank you. Hello, my name is Annika, I'm from Germany, and I wanted to ask you the following question. Do you think that the 8th of May should be a public holiday in Germany, as it is for example in France? Thank you for your answer. I wish you a good day and an interesting discussion. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much for these questions. It's all about commemoration and remembrance. And so the first question goes to you, Mr. Schneiderhan. There was said, what should we do if there are no more witnesses from this time period? Do you think commemoration is also possible without them? Clear answer, yes, but it's more difficult. Let me explain why I say yes. Fortunately, we still have witnesses today. Unfortunately, we have a last chance to use them, to use their experience and to document their experience, to document it in words, in pictures, in modern media, which we can provide to the younger generation. Our responsibility is to understand what they are telling us. And if we combine what they are telling us and un our understanding, my generation are born after the war, this opens the way for bringing the messages to young people, even if there are no living uh, witnesses amongst us. Unfortunately, we didn't use it too long after the Second World War. There was a time where we did not speak about it, where we didn't ask them, and where they are not able to talk about their experience of a time which I, which we, we, we cannot, uh, how should I say, we cannot imagine what they have behind them. And so it was a difficult time to approach to each other in an openness which open minds and hearts to discuss what they have witnessed. And so far, again, the answer is yes, but the means are complicated and uh, require that we think deeply and respectfully how to do it. Thank you. Mrs. Minterfering, you are long after the war born, but do you have a connection to it? And does it affect your work and your engagement in politics? Yes, it's, it's true. Um, most of us have never experienced war in person. Uh, we didn't have to. 
Um, we were the lucky generation after the World War, the um, afterborns. And for me personally, as for many of, uh, of my generation um, who are engaged in politics, um, history is part um, of, of motivation, of a motor of the motivation. Um, I got there um, right uh, after, after school. Um, we visited Bergen-Belsen mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there I, I met a Jewish lady, a witness of the time of the World War, who survived the World War and the concentration camp. And I will never forget that. And this was very important to me. Um, I, I remember a story this lady told us. She went to New York um, after the end of the World War. And years later, she went shopping in Manhattan in a mall. And there, she saw the former guard of the camp dressed in a fur, the Nazi who did all the terrible things to the prisoners. And this guard was peacefully shopping in Manhattan. And that story, hearing that from that lady, that was kind of an eye-opener to me. Later, uh, later on, it was the lyrics of Paul Celan um, who taught me what no human can really understand. So, yes, history is a motor of my motivation and I will always support project, projects like this for the younger generation of remembrance. And this is why I also had an idea of uh, setting up a new program, um, Youth Remembers, uh, so to give more young people the opportunity to learn and to exchange. And this is what I will always support. Thank you. Maybe to bring these two opinions together, what Mr. Schneiderhand said, what you said, well, yes, we learned and we, we heard stories in school, when we met people. On the other hand was what Mr. Schneiderhand said, many people didn't speak a long time about the war, especially here in Germany. We had the problem how to speak about our relatives. And I would like to, to give you this question about commemoration in Germany especially, Mr. Schneiderhan. Second World War, we all know, was an aggression from Germany. It, is, it was a war of extermination from Germany. But also, it were German soldiers who also died, so that also we had to commemorate our own people. Is that possible? How can it be possible? Yeah, thank you for the question. First of all, I would add a remark to the last uh, sequence of our discussion. My own experience is that we didn't want to hear from them a long time. When they started to talk about war, I remember myself that I asked my father, stop it now, it's enough, it's past, we look forward. We do not want to hear permanently about this un unbelievable time. That's, so it was a, a, a reciprocal behavior we had. But to your, to your precise question again, yes, I think it's possible. We think of German soldiers. We mourn for them with their families, with their friends, with their relatives, yes. We do it in respect, we do it in dignity, but to make it quite clear, we do not praise heroes at this occasion. We respect <coughs> what they suffered, what they had to do, yes, always yes, but we cannot separate their activities in war from our responsibility they gave us. They gave us with their doing as soldiers or other participants in war. It is a dilemma for soldiers 
always, in all histories, in all times, soldiers sent to war have the dilemma that they can be killed in war, but they have also to kill in war. This is a dilemma which is natural and which is in the nature of the soldiers doing in all nations, in all times. And this we have to reflect. And we know not of all of them were simply, uh, how should I say, simply uh, victims. Not all of them were simply perpetrated. But all of them passed their fate to our responsibility. And that is what we have to reflect and we had to commemorate and we have to yeah, understand by heart and by brain and to build a society which can live with it and overcomes all these events. Again, we commemorate in respect and dignity, but we don't praise heroes when we do commemorate our own soldiers of Second and First World War, so far perhaps. Well, you see, uh, I hope we can tackle a little bit the question you gave to us. And anyway, um, we have, in this case, it's very difficult to answer this question, I think. And for first, we are different ages. On the other hand, we come from different countries. So maybe for all of you, there will be different answers on that. What I think personally is, I would now, I would really like to ask my parents, my grandparents about this time. And it's too late. I'm, I'm not happy about that, that I cannot take these questions anymore. And therefore, I think what you said, witnesses on the one hand is very important to find possibilities to have another way on commemoration, as you said, is very important to have the stories to bring them together and to see the different sides, uh, sides as Mr. Schneiderhan said, is important. But there was one question more from your audience asking about the holiday in Berlin. And this is, of course, a question to you, Mrs. Minterfering. Would you think the 8th of May should be, as it is this year, extraordinary in Berlin only, it should be a holiday for all Germany as this is the case in other parts of Europe? This is a good question. Um, I spent the day uh, in Berlin today, and as you pointed out, um, it's a public holiday in our capital because of the 75th anniversary of the end of the war, and um, I think that was a good idea to do so. Um, I felt it really made a difference um, tomorrow, tomorrow we will have the anniversary of the Schumann Declaration and a cornerstone, important cornerstone for the European integration. And independently, I think, from the question if we declare the 8th of May a public holiday or not, um, I'm convinced that we have to find ways um, to stand up against racism against nationalism in Europe. And we need a European answer and a European discussion how to do so. Thank you. I so I, I would give the question back to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And therefore, I also would add now the question to you, Ms. Amore. What do you think it is a good idea to yes, have a holiday? Yes, yes, a very good idea. Because uh, there are so many um, uh, neighbors of, of Germany remembering, uh, remembering this 8th of May in the East, 9th of May, but uh, this is not important at that point, Rem remembering end of World War II. And it's only Germany uh, who thinks, okay, we, we did our homework, it's all written down in our uh, books and uh, uh, we have good historians and, and so on and so on. But um, uh, so we sometimes think uh, there's no need to remember. I think for us it's a good chance to focus on, on, on these points which are made around us. So uh, the 8th of May as a Remembrance Day in Germany would be fine for the next decade. So we give this back to the <laughs> Foreign Ministry <laughs> as a challenge. 
Mr. Scheinheim? May I add one aspect which is in, in, in my mind very important. I, I support what you said. <coughs> we need for our work of memory, if I may say so, we need events, we need kickoffs. Yeah? And uh, uh, today we have today is such a kickoff, a concrete kickoff which gives us a chance to elaborate all the surroundings of this kickoff and to talk about the threats of the future, to talk about what's happening in Germany today. I was on the Jewish cemetery today with the British and Canadian ambassador. It, it is it's an extremely strong feeling at this day on the Jewish uh, cemetery in Berlin where the war started and ended for Germany and now sitting here in these rooms. Without such kick-off events, it is extremely difficult in daily life when you have corona, when you have whatever you want, missing money or difficulties with the United Nations or the EU or NATO or whatever you have. It's very difficult to concentrate people's mind and heart on, on this extremely important work we have together to do and that's why I would support that we use it as a normal holiday in Berlin and I enjoy to be here in Berlin with you together. Thank you. Thank you. So please take this to the foreign office and to the government. We want another holiday. <laughs> and um, I use the opportunity what, <laughs> what Mr. Schneiderhan said again to say we have a kickoff and we also have for everybody who just joined in now to repeat, this is a discussion we do open for Peace Line project virtually. We would like to have opened it really in Berlin today. But anyway, we have uh, statements from more than 40 people from 14 different countries. And we want to discuss with them and with Michel Müntefering, State Minister for International Cultural Policy in the German Foreign Office. Wolfgang Schneiderhahn, the president of the German War Graves Commission, and Dr. Jörg Moré, director of the German Russian Museum. Here in that place where the war 75 years ago ended. And I would like now to hand over again to another block uh, tackling the issue of history. Good evening. I am an 18-year-old student from Italy and I've been studying the Second World War uh, for my final exams. I've been reading about uh, the so-called appeasement policy that countries like uh, England and France adopted towards Nazi Germany. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think that those countries and the entire League of Nations should be blamed or held accountable for not being able to stop in any way Hitler from expanding his power all over Europe. And do you also think, do you also believe that if the same situation were, were to occur today, do you think that the modern United Nations could be able to stop it from, to stop history from sadly repeating itself? Thank you so much for your attention. Have a nice day. Could the Second World War have been avoided? If the answer is yes, then how? If the answer is no, then why? Thank you. So my question is, how did Germany manage to overcome all the losses and to rebuild its economy, infrastructure and international relations after the Second World War in a relatively short period of time? Hi, I am Anna from Moldova, I'm 26, and um, I would like to know what are three main things that it takes for a state to rebuild itself after such terrible economic, human and material losses such as World War II. Good evening everybody, my name is Ruxanda and I am from Moldova and I participated in several activities and projects organized and funded by Hans Seidel Foundation here in Moldova as well as in Germany. Today my question is about the end of the Second World War and so we all know that in the late 1945 Germany was divided into East Germany and West Germany. And so why was it so important for the Allied powers to divide Berlin as well? 
Berlin that was situated in the heart of the East Germany. Thank you. Uh, as a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we received a united Germany. Um, several decades have passed since this event, and how do you think the Berlin Wall has finally collapsed in the minds of Germans, and what has contributed to the peaceful and successful integration of uh, Germany into Euro-Atlantic structures? Hi, my name is Martha, I'm from Germany. The 8th of May is often referred to as Hour Zero, meaning the start of a new non-Nazi Germany. Considering that with the end of the war, the Nazis did not suddenly disappear, and keeping in mind that many Nazis, especially doctors, lawyers or judges, both in the FRG and the GDR, were able to resume their work without any significant problems, to what extent can this day really be called a radical new beginning? Whoa, now it's getting hot. <laughs> History. If I understand it rightly, we have there two parts of questions. So the one is the development which led to the war, including the potential responsibility of other nations. And the other questions were more referring on the side of recovery of Germany after 1945. So Mr. Mori, I would get to ye now and like to ask you as a historian to answer the question A, whether it would have been possible to avoid the war, and if, how? And then referring, I think, to the question of Mathers, was it really a new start after 1945? First of all, Hitler wanted the war, so in, in this case you can say there was no way out. Um, secondly, um, I would say the um, common security system in, in Europe, in the world, after World War I was too weak. The, uh, the mechanism of cooperation, of treaties, of coming together um, was um, just in the beginning, so nowadays in, in this uh, view we have uh, better opportunities to react in an international security system. But in the 20s, uh, this, uh, there was no system like this. This is an overcoming system from the 19th century, one state um, against another and bilateral treaties and so on and so on. So, um, to avoid World War II, I would say no chance, uh, shortly. And uh, yeah, s the situation after 45. Um, first of all, Germany was very lucky in one, one sense. Okay, we were divided, so we are not lucky. Uh, this division of Germany is already 30 years ago, so it makes easier for me nowadays, 75 years later, of, after the end of World War II, to say <coughs> it was, we were lucky. Um, there was a deep or a very, very strong interest by the Allied, by the uh, uh, yeah, Allied um, um, of the victor, victors, you can say, of the of the nations to to um, think about Germany as a, to to come in a stable situation. So this is a kind of thinking in a in a security system. Okay, we were divided in two blocks, but this gave stability. And um, so, um, for in this kind, it was a new chance for us. And uh, for the two Germanys, there were very different uh, chances, you can say. But uh, nevertheless, in, in the GDR, they took the chance as well. Um, and in uh, some of the discussions we had uh, in the 90s, so after the reunification of Germany, but um, in, a, in a good condition. So nowadays, 75 years ago, I would say, yes, we were very lucky and we had a good chance to, to make it a better way. And in some way, we, 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 did it. we did it. Well, actually, yeah, we were lucky, but the question was a little bit regarding the people who got, and you said it was stability, it was also stability in a negative way, because people got into positions who were really in position in the Nazi time. So, did this influence the development of Germany? Yes, of course, but uh, 
how can I say it? This is a, it's a moral question. <laughs> Morality, yeah, this is another other point. Uh, uh, looking on history, uh, it's so easy to say you're wrong or you're not wrong. So, of course, we have this uh, uh, approach and uh, for, for Germany, for for both Germanys, it was very hard to, to cope with. And in, in Western Germany, there were the, so strong discussions about the uh, yeah, end of the 60s and so on. Um, but we, we went through. So, uh, in a look back, so what? We, 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 we made it. Don't forget it. That's important. This is history. Don't forget it. And, uh, and don't repeat it, <laughs> please. But um, at the end, I said, yes, we are lucky. Mr. Schneider? If you allow me to add one aspect. <clears throat> In the Second World War, Germany lost at least one generation of young people. So there was no way in 45 to start with only young people because they are on the symmetries in 46 people, uh, countries on this world. So this whole generation died with 18, 90, 20, 23 years. Yeah. And so the need to build up a new Germany despite the, or respecting what you said about moral questions, there was no other way than to use those who survived the war. And unfortunately, those survived who were at home in Germany and organized the apparatus with the Nazi, Nazis, Nazis used. So this is a dilemma we had at the beginning. Um, and the other point, Herr Moré, which I, I would just ask you, what do you think about this aspect? We heard a lot of time, a war breaks out. And I think a war doesn't break out. A war is made. It must be prepared by people, by industry, by military, by propaganda, by whatever means, we, fake news, <laughs> if I may use the word of today. And the question of the young people is also in my mind in the direction did the other nations not see in Germany what's going on in Germany with regard to preparing a war with all the steps which are made openly? It, it was no secret that the economy was uh, configured for being a war economy. The military was brought high and in fast speed and propaganda machinery was uh, activated in an unbelievable way. And nations around, didn't they see it or didn't they understand it? Or Maybe it just to add there, there was an exhibition I in the foreign... Uh, I mean, I'm not... Foreign ministry about uh, the embassies in the time before the war and how they recognized what happened in Germany. So it was seen, I think, or... It was seen, but in, in uh, thinking in terms of the 19th century, everyone is preparing a war every time. So it's uh, business as usual, you can say. Mm -hmm. And if you are lucky and have a good treaty, for example, yeah, the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact, so uh, the treaty between the Soviet Union and the German Reich in, in August uh, 39, this is kind of good deal, Stalin thought. And he didn't expect the German attack uh, two years later. He expected, but not two years later. So this is a we are this is a huge discussion even about this 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 pact. But nevertheless, this was a kind of usual business. Everyone was preparing, and nowadays we know Hitler was focusing on on the war. He wanted the war. He prepared the war, and um, yeah, the other countries. They, they saw it, of course, but uh, they, how can I say, they, they failed to, to see the danger so soon, I would say. Mm. Yeah, even today, sometimes for me it's difficult to understand when people, responsible people, use the saying, if you want peace, prepare war. <laughs> it's a common saying. Everywhere I can hear it. There is a danger you just described. Mm. This is extremely difficult, this small sentence. You prepare war and at the end you have it. Right. 
Sorry yeah, for... Is, no, no, that's right. And, and we will come back to it, I, th I think, later on. But I would like to, to get over to the other part of the questions, which okay. were about the recovery. Sorry. Mrs. Minterfering, what do you think, which elements of the German recovery would be, on, from your point of view, the most important? Uh, well, the, the most important aspect, of course, was the action of the Allies, the international community. So the decision to give Germany another cha chance um, after such a short time, that was almost a miracle, at least a strong and a brave decision. So the international community believed that peace could only prevail if in Europe the economic reconstruction would also be successful. And looking on Germany after, after the war, I would, I would point out two special groups. First, the, the women, of course, um, who built up uh, Germany and played a big role in the reconstruction process. We call them Trümmer Frauen, I don't know how to translate, <laughs> maybe somebody of you can. Um, and the second group is, I would like to mention, is the migrant, the group of the migrant workers. We call them guest workers. And many of them stayed and uh, became part of Germany, especially in the region where I grew up in the Ruhr district, the Ruhr area, in the western part of Germany. And they were working in, as miners, for example, as coal miners. And um, yeah, it was also, um, it were those groups who helped concretely in Germany um, building up the country again. Thank you. There was also a question you, you, you now pointed out uh, inside Germany uh, and this integration and recovery. Mr. Schneiderhan, what is your experience? You have a lot of experience with Germany's integration in the NATO. How well did this function? What do you think? Is Germany an accepted partner in the NATO? Again, it's the beginning, a clear yes. What you mentioned, uh, Frau Müntefering, is the important starting point. It is a miracle that we were accepted by our former enemies in a free world, and they did believe us that we are really willing to start from a new and to way to explore and to develop a new Germany, a better Germany. Uh, yeah, a Germany with a different approach to culture and dignity like in the past. That is a miracle and it remains a miracle. Germany is a reliable partner. NATO is a difficult construction. We have 28 nations and before a decision all must say yes. Everybody has one voice. Luxembourg has one voice and the United States of America also one voice. Somebody doesn't believe it, but it is true. So to find compromises in strategic worldwide questions which are spread over a wide uh, area of uh, challenges. It is an economic question. It is not only military. It is a political issue to prepare to, uh, for dissociation and things like that. I have good experience. We had an excellent time when we helped those countries after the end of the Soviet Union to find stability after they were free nations and we could, we could integrate them and Germany could help because we had an understanding what integration means. No other nation, by the way, in NATO has the experience to integrate parts of their own country which were in former times part of the enemy 
if mm. I may say it so simple and strictly. And after the breakdown of the separation of Germany, we integrated the National People's Army. Yeah. So we have experienced what it means after a lost war or a not war to integrate, to find the integration. And this is <coughs> what the others accepted as a specific German experience which we could use to help to understand. There are nations who have no experience, but because they never lost a war, and they never had the need to bring their nation up after a disastrous war. And no nation has the experience to integrate former enemies in the own armed forces. And uh, <coughs> with playing this issue, playing this advantage we have, by all other means, we are reliable, we are not easy, we have an open society. In an open society, international security questions are openly discussed. And they have a yes and there is a no. There is an opposition and there is a government. <laughs> and uh, this is also true for military and security issues. And that is accepted, I think, by all. And what we did till now in Afghanistan, remember, Afghanistan is one example. German soldiers are longer in Afghanistan now than the First and Second World War lasted together. Yeah. Just, and this is accepted by NATO. And so far the answer is yes. And I gave some examples for my yes. Yeah, uh, I think we should look on the timetable a little bit. And I think we, since we could talk about this issue, I think for hours and hours, it's, it's a quite interesting part of the discussion. But anyway, you will see in the next block about the future of Europe that uh, s some of this, what you said, will also refer to the questions will, which will come now in the next block. Hello, my name is Laura Popa and I'm studying international studies. A few months ago, we discussed Winston Churchill 1946 speech advocating for the United States of Europe during uncertain times. My question is, how do you see the future of European Union now? Thank you. The Second World War saw Europe, like Germany, divided into East and West. To what extent do you believe that we've now achieved a unified and reintegrated continent, and what more could be done to help this process? The lessons learned from the Second World War are quite rightly often discussed. I would be interested to hear what lessons you think can be drawn from the immediate post-war period and, in particular, from the fact that in the London Agreement of 1953, the Federal Republic of Germany was relieved large parts of its debt, a fact which was also pointed out in the discussion on corona bonds. Do you consider this reference to be justified? What significance does this fair treatment of Germany at that time have for the present? Thank you very much for answering. Hello, my name is Elsa. For me, the proofs for peace are public and private friendships. I spent a school year in Poznan, Poland, and for me, it's a great miracle to have Polish friends now. It shows that people do not define me through the actions of my great-grandparents. That's why I think that all we should focus on, in honor to the victims of World War II and for a good European future, is building up friendships in the private sense and in the political sense, because friendships are built on solidarity and real sympathy, and those are the opposite of war. The situation on the Greek islands shows that the political actions of the EU are not always based on solidarity. That has to change. Peace and friendships are values that mustn't end at the European borders. So as a Belarusian, I'm highly concerned about the state of affairs in my homeland, uh, which was a battlefield during the Second World War and a victim of, at first, Nazi and then communist occupations. Without any doubt, we have huge problems uh, with domestic policy and uh, autocratic authorities that uh, disobey the rule of law and violate human rights and many more. But uh, here um, I want to speak about uh, external obstacles that we have 
and that do not allow us to turn into a genuinely democratic and free country. And here I mean our eastern neighbor, namely Russia, that uh, at the moment has quite aggressive and uh, annexationist policy. So we all have seen the uh, example of Ukraine, where military conflict is still ongoing and Crimea is annexed. And I believe no one wants such a fate to Belarus. So we should confess that uh, Belarus is way more dependent on Russia than Ukraine and the consequences of democratization could be even more appalling. So my first question is whether you think democratic and free Belarus is possible without democratic Russia? And if yes, in what way? And uh, my second question, um, as a, I'm also pacifist and the question of peace is very important for me. So do you think military neutrality is achievable in the presence of such a neighbor as Russia or Belarus should in any case uh, become a part of a military alliance such as NATO, for example? So thank you very much and greetings from Vilnius. Hi, my name is Inken, I'm 24 years old and I'm from Hamburg, Germany. My question today is about the right shift we're experiencing in multiple European countries at the moment. And I think or I suppose it is an effect of something. So my question is, what do you think is the cause of it? And after determining or describing the possible causes, what do you think are plans or possibilities to counteract? We should be thankful for the end of the war, but also for the memory of the war, uh, which prevents us from doing the same mistake again in the future. Um, but we are only uh, 75 years uh, after the end of the last war in Europe. So I was wondering uh, in, in the distant future when this tragic but still important memory of war will fade, uh, do you think it's possible that there could be an, another war in Europe? Well, thank you all for your questions. I would like a little bit to improvise and to add the next block already uh, after that because uh, the issues about the coronavirus, they are tackling some of these questions we heard now. And I also would like to add one question I got from Stephanie from Great Britain, whether also we, should, we could do more about cross-border activities and cooperation. So if the techniques are prepared, I would like to ask them now to add the, the next questions and we would then answer to all of them together. My name is Tizian and I live in Berlin. And my question is, does the Corona crisis lead to renationalization of the member states and hence to an endangerment of the uh, integrity of the EU? Hi there, it's Edna from Barcelona, Catalonia. So the foundation of the European Union was meant to assure peace in our continent. However, the Europe's reaction to the coronavirus situation has been rather weak. So do you think this may eventually put in danger Europe's peace? Thank you. Can the economic crisis of the uh, 1920s be compared to what Europe will face after the coronavirus pandemic ends? Uh, next one. Can the economic crisis that threatens Europe after the pandemic lead to the awakening of radical movements? Simply put, should we uh, be afraid of the emergence of authoritarian system? If so, will Germany take action in this matter? Why is the German government refusing so much measures like Corona bonds that would help um, countries in economic difficulty that for sure would bring some fiscal disadvantages to Germany? But here in Germany, we are rather well off, not only in the Corona crisis, but generally. 
And uh, I think European solidar solidarity means that we um, take clear steps and that we prove that the European Union is not just a shared market uh, that can bring us economic advantages, but it's, it's about uh, solidarity. It's about uh, helping others up if they are down. And at the moment, we have a situation where in Italy, people think uh, China is a better partner than Germany. And how could it come so far? Thanks for a re reaction to this. Hello. Uh, thanks for answering your question. So here is mine. Um, in view of the number of anti-Semitic or far-right attacks like in Halle, in Germany or everywhere in Europe, do you believe that the education to the Second World War was a success? And if, if not, what, what was wrong and what should be improved? Thanks. Well, trying to, to bring your questions together, I would say so. One is about, is Europe, is a European Union still the answer? on the wars, or is it already not anymore the future, but already the past? How we can guarantee the solidarity in Europe if there is so much tension? And on the other side, there were the question about the coronavirus and that necessity to keep distance and to close borders, could that lead to Renationalization and endanger the European integration. So this part where the question, and I would like to ask you, Ms. M Mrs. Montefering, the first question: Can we still believe in European solidarity? Europe is worth fighting for, and solidarity is the core of the European Union. So, especially in this crisis, we have to stand together. But the future is open. We have seen rising nationalism in the past, um, even in Europe. And I have, no, I have not the only answer to all of that question. So much questions are left now and uh, so less time. So just maybe um, in the end, let me give just, just, just one, one final answer maybe to, to all of you out there. Um, History of the future is not written yet. We have to write the history of a strong Europe. And therefore, we need people like you engaging in all those questions. And the truth is that we, have, we need a common answer. Solidarity means that not one country give um, the command. Um, it means that we have to come to common answers to, to the big questions and um, that we have to work on the solidarity. And that is um, what we are doing at the moment. And um, yeah, how are we engaging? So. Um, this is, I think, the most important um, message for today, that Europe means the promise of togetherness and of peace. Thank you. Mr. Schneiderhahn, also in times of corona, are there possibilities also for NGOs like yours to fight racism, to overcome the closed borders? Of course, Corona is not an excuse for doing nothing. Uh, it's an event which, which will pass away also. So whatever we don't do today because of Corona, we will regret tomorrow. So, of course it is possible. And my message to all of you, all of all to us, is I must do something, not they must do something. It's not an institution where we can delegate the question to the, our association or to the Foreign Office. No, we, we must stand up and say, no, 
to those who go the wrong way again. A clear no to them. This needs a little bit courage, but I think young people have enough energy and courage to say no, if it's required. In time, no. Well, thank you. The hour is over, and before we end this uh, discussion, I would take that what you said, Mr. Schneiderhan, it's up to you to take the words, it's up to everybody to say something before something wrong happens. And I would like to thank you that you used that opportunity, that you sent us so many questions, so many remarks, so many, yeah, really good statements about what it's needed to do, what you think. And I would like to give this last question to Violetta from Kishinau in Moldova, and just as a command and a final word to, to give you the floor and to thank you all before leaving, to thank here in the, on the panel Mr. Schneiderhahn, Mrs. Müntefering, Mr. Murray. Hope to see you soon. Hope you will join our peace, peace line routes and stay healthy. Have a good day. Thank you. Now we'll Hello, follow my name is Violetta Avram. I am from Chisinau and I work for a German political foundation. Coming from a former Soviet Republic where in the aftermath of the Second World War the society was trapped in another reality, that of the communist regime, and where after the collapse of the Soviet Union a conflict in the eastern part of the country erupted, I truly believe that only educating new generations of people in the spirit of peace, compassion, courage and critical thinking, we could learn not to admit such atrocities happen ever again. That is why I would like to use this opportunity to underline the importance of the educational work the German War Grave Commission and political foundations supported by the German Federal Ministry of External Affairs are doing, especially in the eastern part of Europe, through different projects for young people on political education and remembrance culture, such as Peace Line Project is. Mm -hmm.